Hi, everybody. I'm Darlene Prides. I'd like to thank you for this invitation to speak and reflect on the significance of the stigmata in this year of 2024, when we celebrate the 800th anniversary of St. Francis receiving the stigmata. I want to apologize for not being able to be with you live, albeit virtually, on October 6th when this presentation will air for the webinar for the Secular Franciscans. But I want to assure you that I am taking you with me on my work and faith obligations. I will actually be preparing to facilitate a pilgrimage, and I'll be in Rome on the 6th. So I wasn't able to, to be with you live, but know that I hold you in prayer. And for those of you watching this recording after it originally airs on October 6th, know that I will have held you in prayer in both Rome and Assisi on this pilgrimage. Now let me start my PowerPoint presentation. Always takes a moment to get this set up. So I entitled this presentation, The Stigmata and Authentic Faith Today, because I really want us to explore this experience of authenticity and where the story of the stigmata fits into our authentic faith and where Francis's experience, so even more than the story, but the experience of the stigmata, where that fits into our shared faith and our respective faith. Now, when considering the life of Francis of Assisi in its various periods, the various segments of his life, we can consider that the stigmata, which he received in 1224 at Laverna, ushered in the, the final period of his life, that life, uh, that period of life that we might call decline, leading to its end. I'd like us to reconsider that. Is this period of life which is ushered in by the stigmata something deeper, more inviting? Is this period of life actually when he opens up more completely, more fully to embrace Christ? I'd like us to explore in this presentation this notion of Francis's mystical intimacy with Christ. First, by asking each of us to consider some questions about the relevance of the stigmata for us today as people of faith in the Franciscan family. Now, as I mentioned, this the year in which I'm uh, recording this is 2024. We have already celebrated the 800th anniversary of Francis's receiving the stigmata on September 17th. I'm recording this on Saturday, September 21st. Because of that celebration that we've already experienced, you have likely read and reread many accounts of this miraculous encounter in the woods. You have likely revisited famous art depictions of this imprinting of wounds on Francis's body. So you are very well prepared to answer this first question. What does it mean to you, to you individually and your faith? that Francis of Assisi received the stigmata or the wounds of the crucified Christ on his body. What does it mean to you individually? And here I invite you, should you have a paper, a pencil nearby, just jot down some, some ideas, some thoughts that you have. And I invite you to pause this recording, if that serves you, just to jot down some thoughts. And now moving forward, now that we have processed some of our habit energy around taking notes and thinking analytically or thinking with our mind, I'd like us just to take a deep breath. Let it go with sound. Maybe push away that paper and pencil, paper and pen, that computer that you might be taking notes on. The great luxury of having this recorded is that you can revisit this in time. It will be here for you to take notes at a later time, to revisit anything I might say. 
But how is it that we can cultivate this capacity to be present in our, in our own faith? And I think that is the first step in understanding or, or deeply appreciating Francis's experience of the stigmata, to be deeply present with what is, to open up to what is. Now, how do we use Franciscan stories in our faith as members of the Franciscan family? Do we allow the authenticity of these stories to work on us? That is, do we enter into these stories and allow for the full range of human experience to inform our faith, our lives? Or, or do we try to uh, bypass the uncomfortable parts? Do we run away from the hard stuff, the messy stuff, the dirty stuff? Francis teaches us, and you know very well, I don't have to tell you this, Francis teaches us that perfect joy is not mere cheerfulness, no. Instead, reaching perfect joy requires passing through, not bypassing, but passing through sadness and beauty, pain and happiness, sorrow and delight, all of it, the full range of human experience, not bypassing any piece of it. The story of the stigmata is a particularly challenging story, I think. After all, how many of us can really relate to receiving the stigmata, the wounds of the crucified Christ? Now, one way into this story is to contextualize Francis's experience at Laverna within his life story. It's easy for us to forget the isolation Francis experienced throughout his adult life, the desolation he felt, the doubt he sensed. These were not mere thoughts or ideas, but a visceral sense of despair that he experienced in his adult life. Now, there's no need for me to recap his full life story. You know it better than I do. But instead, I'd like to start in the year 1220, just to highlight a few episodes that inform our understanding of his reception of the stigmata. In 1220, that was the year that Francis stepped down from leadership of his order. His small group of companions had quickly outgrown his capacity to administer them, to guide them effectively. As my colleague Bill Short often says, Francis had many charismatic gifts. He could inspire through both word and example, no doubt about that. But he couldn't organize lint in his pocket, let alone the growing community of friars. He recognized that in 1220, and he stepped down. We can easy gloss, easily gloss over this, right? We, we've read this many times. But if any of you have retired from work or from a leadership role or from any role, you may know how challenging that can be, even when you retire willingly. You may have had nagging thoughts and judgments. They're not doing things right. Francis had those thoughts. You might have had anxiety about the future of the organization or the family or culture in general. Francis did too. You might have felt at a loss as to what to do or a harbored sense of self-doubt over how you have spent your life. It seems that Francis did too. He harbored those feelings of self-doubt. And in those months and even years after stepping down from leadership, he could be petulant and angry with the friars. He was very moody, actually, throughout his life. He was always a moody guy. But at this time, there are some very many bitter stories of his anger lashing out at fellow friars precisely when they weren't doing things the way he thought they should be done. We also know that at this time, he increasingly suffered from poor health. Poor health can aggravate moodiness, can't it? 
So he's lost his role. He's, he's in despair. He's not feeling well. We know in 1223, there was a new rule approved by the Pope, the Regula Bulata, in late November of 1223. Now, this could be cause for a great celebration. But this rule was juridical in tone, very different than the evangelical spiritual sensibilities that Francis brought to his lived experience of faith. Some scholars have speculated that Francis left Rome in late November 1223, disappointed, even alienated from the direction of the order. And last year, we know, huh, we celebrated his, his detour over to Greccio. We know that he found a bomb for his disquiet by going up to Greccio in December, not because it was easy to get to. It was not. It's still not easy to get to. But his spirits were buoyed with the experience of the living nativity, which he developed and shared with the people of Greccio, whom he loved. We just celebrated that, that beautiful and tender um, experience last December. Clearly, this experience of the living nativity and sharing it with the people of Greccio, the people he loved, buoyed his spirits. But finding his way eventually back to Assisi, and over time, his spirits plunged again. And during the year of 1224, he once again found himself in a place of dismay and uncertainty. So it is in this visceral state of vulnerability, he made his way to Laverna with his companion, Brother Leo. Again, I, I pause here because we can so quickly just gloss over with words what this sensibility must have been like. So I just ask you, and I, I pause here from, from my script here, just to ask all of us to consider, how is it that you feel in your body when you are feeling despair, when you're feeling dejected, when you are feeling self-doubt? Is it a series of thoughts, it may, may include thoughts, but I, I sense that there may be some visceral reactions in our body. Our, our heart might beat fast or it might be ve beat very slow. We might be agitated or we might be dejected and not be able to move. This level of vulnerability that's caused by despair, caused by depression, This is not something that can easily be bypassed if we are authentic to it, if we listen to it, if we experience it and acknowledge it. I think this is the state that Francis was in when he arrived at Laverna in 1224. Now, there are a few accounts of what Francis experienced at Laverna. Many of you have likely read them. Uh, recently because of the 800th celebration. But I'd like to read just a portion from Cholano's first life of Francis, book two, chapter three. It's important that we reread these words. We reread scripture all the time, right? Rereading allows us to go deeper, to consider contemplatively. So I'd like us to sit with this text. While he was staying in that hermitage called Laverna, after the place where it was located, two years prior to the time that he returned his soul to heaven, he saw in the vision of God a man having six wings like a seraph, standing over him, arms extended and feet joined, affixed to a cross. Two of his wings were raised up, two were stretched out, over his head as if for flight, and two covered his whole body. When the blessed servant of the Most High saw these things, he was filled with the greatest awe, but could not decide what this vision meant for him. He couldn't figure out what it meant cognitively, intellectually, but he experienced it. 
Moreover, he greatly rejoiced and was much delighted by the kind and gracious look that he saw the seraph give him. The seraph's beauty was beyond comprehension. But the fact that the seraph was fixed to the cross and the bitter suffering of that passion thoroughly frightened him. Consequently, he got up both sad and happy as joy and sorrow took their turns in his heart. Concerned over the matter, he kept thinking about what this vision could mean and his spirit was anxious to discern a sensible meaning from the vision. While he was unable to perceive anything clearly understandable from the vision, its newness very much pressed upon his heart. Signs of the nails began to appear on his hands and feet, just as he had seen them a little while earlier on the crucified man hovering over him. His hands and feet seemed to be pierced through the middle of nail by nails with the heads of the nails appearing on the inner parts of his hands and on the upper part of his feet, and their points protruding on opposite sides. Those marks on the inside of his hands were round, but rather oblong on the outside, and small pieces of flesh were visible like the points of the nails bent over and flattened, extending beyond the flesh around them. On his feet, the marks of the nails were stamped in the same way and raised above the surrounding flesh. His right side was marked with an oblong scar as if pierced with a lance. And this often dripped blood so that his tunic and undergarments were frequently stained with his holy blood. And the passage goes on to, to share with us that Francis often kept these wounds hidden he shared them with only a few companions. I think it's notable that Chilano acknowledges Francis was both happy and sad, that he experienced both joy and sorrow, and that all of this mixture of emotions took turns in his heart, cycling through. This was not an easy or simple experience. No, it was complex. Chilano also tells us that Francis experienced anxiety and tried to make sense out of the experience of the seraph. He tried to make cognitive sense, tried to reason, find a logical meaning. And it was then that he began to see the wounds appear on his body, almost as if to override the, the tendency to make logical sense out of this. That's when the wounds appeared. It's notable that Chilano tells us some of what Francis went through, this cycling of emotions, this effort to make it all rational, neat, and understandable. Uh, but sometimes, maybe most of the time, what we experience in faith, how we experience our God, is best sensed through our bodies without efforts to clarify, rationalize, theologize. These wounds that we may experience in our own lives make us vulnerable, make us receptive to Christ. It's true that Francis kept his own wounds private. He showed them only to a few people. Perhaps like many of us keep our, our inner wounds, our psychological wounds, emotional wounds, and even some physical wounds, perhaps we keep them private. And yet, Francis shows us that these wounds opened him up, opened him up to receiving Christ in an intimate way, in a new way, more completely than he had before. So I close part one of this reflection with us today with a prayer, and I ask you to join, join with me, opening your arms up. In this open stance, you can have your arms up or down as at the statue. Notice any thoughts that you might have as you take this pose, any judgments that cross your mind with this invitation, notice. And if you would, put them aside and open your arms. Acknowledge them now and put them aside. Open your arms to receive these words of Francis 
that I invite you to recite with me. Most high, glorious God, enlighten the darkness of my heart and give me true faith, certain hope and perfect charity, sense and knowledge, Lord that I may carry out your holy and true command. I invite you to pause this recording before moving on to part two. Francis's experience of receiving the stigmata is one of the few stories from our Franciscan tradition that I used to keep at a distance, I'll admit that. It wasn't as personally challenging to me as the story of Francis's encounter with the leper, which inspired me to reflect on my own habit energy of reactivity, of reacting to people who triggered me. This story wasn't as comforting to me as the story of Francis picking up a worm out of the street and putting it off to the side so it wouldn't be trampled in the middle of the road. I always found that charming and um, moving, deeply moving. It also wasn't as inspiring to me as the story of Francis's meeting with Sultan Malik al-Kamil, this story that opens up the potential for interfaith dialogue, or at least conversation. Oh, now I held the story of the stigmata in great reverence, don't get me wrong. I could pray with images of the seraph imprinting the wounds onto Francis, but in fact, it was easy for me to gloss over the raw significance of these wounds and to spiritualize the event. This is what I mean by having kept it at a distance. We might be perfectly able to think about Francis receiving the wounds. And because we can think about this, we can talk about it. We can talk about Francis bearing the wounds of Christ. And because we can talk about it, we can pray about how this experience brings Christ closer to us. But I do wonder, I wonder if this story offers an invitation for us to go even deeper. How do we enter into the story of the spiritual wounds deeply enough so that we acknowledge our own experience of woundedness and the possibility of the sacredness of even our own wounds, whether they be emotional, psychological, or physical, or all three? One way to discover where we are with the stigmata and Francis's encounter with the divine is to tell the story of the stigmata in our own words. And so I'd like to ask you, how do you tell the story? Perhaps after this presentation, you might take some time and, and tell the story in your own words, enter into the story to bring life to these words that we know so well, that we've read so much from Chalana and Bonaventure. For me, I tell the story through my own encounter with a woman who taught me how to appreciate the stigmata. And yes, even to begin to understand the pain that Francis felt, not in an academic way, not in an analytical way, or even by mere recitation of the words of Chalana or Bonaventure. No, it was through her tears and silence that I came to understand the stigmata that Francis bore. It was around 1990 and uh, that I started to have a sense of Francis's experience of receiving the stigmata. That I had a sense that this was an experience that could move me, that could be relevant, that I could work with in my own faith. I had a sense of this, and I use that word sense quite deliberately here. Now, I was a doctoral student studying Franciscan history. I had left institutionalized uh, Christianity as a college student and was content about being an agnostic about faith. I was happened to be living in Rome at the time, researching a medieval Franciscan layman who preached. So I spent most of my days in the library and most of my weekends touring churches and historical sites with my friends. 
And then in the evenings, I sat and watched TV with my landlady, Signora Bacchini. Now, Signora Bacchini, oh my gosh, she was a little hard of hearing, so she kept the TV on really loudly. Uh, she was also a strong extrovert and added lots of hand gestures to whatever she was saying, whether it was about the news, the anchor man or the anchor woman, uh, game shows and the hosts, and certainly about the contestants. She was so effusive and constant in her interactions with the TV. You know, I actually, frankly, got a little confused. I wasn't sure if I was supposed to be listening to her and responding to her or if I could listen to the TV at the same time. There's just a lot going on in these evenings of watching TV. I often went to bed exhausted. But one night, one night was very different from all the others. It took place around Easter time and the movie Francesco was on TV. Now that movie directed by Liliana Cavani is one that uh, follows the life of Francis and it featured the movie star Ricky, uh, Mickey Rourke as Francis. Very different depiction of Francis than what we see in Zeffirelli's brother, son, sister moon. In the movie Francesco, perhaps you've seen it, we see a Francis who is moody, dirty, sometimes cruel to his companions, sometimes confused, depressed, and often in doubt. Signora Bacchini had a lot to say about this Francis until he got to Laverna. During this scene, she was quiet. We watched together in silence as Mickey Rourke portrayed Francis suffering from self-doubt and distance from God. He instructed Leo to wait for him while he climbed deeper into the forest of Laverna, whimpering in desolation, pleading in his search, God, speak to me, speak to me. I noticed Senora reach for a tissue during this scene. The pain and anguish that was depicted of Francis, she felt that, she felt that in her body. She gasped as the film dip showed a flock of birds swoop with a clap over Leo who looked up and sensed something had happened. And then the camera turned immediately to Francis on the ground, bleeding with stark music. In both pain and in joy, Francis looks at his bleeding body and sobs. God spoke to me. Deus mihi dixit, God spoke to me. As an aside, I have told this story many times and I just cannot tell it without remembering her tears. Senora and I were silent the rest of the night. The only sounds were from the TV and from her weeping, and not from my weeping. <laughs> I might have understood just from watching the movie on my own, maybe, but I honestly think that it was her weeping that taught me the meaning of Francis receiving the stigmata. It's not something that is understood with analysis or academic explanation, at least not fully. It's an experience of the divine that is best conveyed through our own sensitivity. Now, many great artists have depicted this scene. The image I'd like to bring forward for our reflection is this one here, which is no longer exists. It used to stand in the interior courtyard at Mission Santa Barbara in California. This statue wasn't intended to depict the stigmata, actually. But instead, the statue was made out of driftwood that was weakened by the salt water of the Pacific Ocean and was carved into the image of Francis and then began to fall apart, to let go, to open up. Much as our lives begin to unravel as we age, much as we are invited and then often forced to let go of our physical capacities, our roles in life, and possibly our self-identity, when that is tied to work or other roles that we can no longer complete, there is this hole, this gap. 
some might see as a loss or even a wound. But here in this image of Francis, we can see that this wounded area, this dis decayed space, this is the only place, the only place where the true color of the wood shows through. This magnificent redwood tree had turned gray from years in the ocean and more years exposed to the elements outside after it had been carved. And the only place where its original, authentic, vibrant color appeared was in this place of woundedness. This image informs my understanding of Francis's experience of receiving the stigmata. The wounds and suffering during the years of his retirement opened him up incrementally, not all at once, incrementally. And as I mentioned before, through, through times of anguish, despair, and um, often petulance, anger, he was hurt. He was dejected. This was not a tender way of transformation. He was judgmental, depressed. His sorrow turned into vulnerability that opened him up to receive Christ more completely, more intimately. His unhappiness led to his radical openness. His complete reception of Christ so intimately did not come from a trained humility or a practiced faith. No, instead, he boldly lived into all of his, what we might call, inner demons in raw authenticity and naked truth. Christ came to him in this state of despair, doubt, dismay, and confusion. In short, in his vulnerability, not in confident faith and obedience. That is where Christ came to him. So before I conclude, I'd like to introduce a few reflection questions for your conversations together and for your ongoing personal reflection to consider what wounds do you carry? These might be physical wounds. This might be physical incapacities. These might be physical different capacities. What emotional, psychological wounds do you have? And perhaps what judgments do you carry around them? What spiritual lessons have you learned from these wounds? Not by bypassing them, not by saying, oh, they don't matter, but by entering into them and exploring what they have taught you. And what elements of your authentic self are revealed through these wounds, because of these wounds. I conclude. For me, this awareness of our wounds, my own wounds, your wounds, it gives me hope. We don't have to broadcast them to the public. We don't have to share them with everyone. But if we are aware of them, perhaps like Francis, our wounds open us up to receive Christ intimately if we allow them to, if we spend time exploring them, praying through them, praying with them. So to conclude, I ask you to be so bold as to allow yourself to be vulnerable tell the mystical story of Francis and the stigmata. You may tell it in words, in art, in music, in dance, or in gesture. You may live it in your poverty, in presence with prisoners, migrants, addicts, and the dying. You might try to bypass the suffering of Francis that Francis endured in his vulnerability but you would also bypass the joy that comes with intimacy with Christ. So in these final two years of Franciscan anniversary celebrations, 
from 2024 through 2026, there will be a lot of letting go and embracing. With both come vulnerability. Live into vulnerability. Peace and all good. Peace and well-being.